No technology is inherently good or bad. What we have to do in social construction of the technology is to maximize the benefits and to mitigate as good as possible the risks. So how can we do that? Well, just in a, in a, in a simple way to think about one way to think about this is there are basically four options in a, in a two by two matrix. And that's you know, in science when we don't know what we do with these conceptual frameworks. We make you know, a two by two matrix. It's the simplest thing of, of putting some things together. So that's what I did here. And but I think it's, it's somehow a useful way to to think about how I how I think about it. So what we have in order to to make that a little bit better and to maximize the benefits and mitigate the risk, which is what we want to do while we have this technology maturing, is well they the existing they the existing powers to be could change it and have more corporate responsibility and they're doing a lot. Nobody that I know in these companies wants to do any kind of harm. So they have been working a lot without actually being forced to do many of these things and sometimes for their own detriment. So this corporate responsibility is a very important factor and has been has been very useful for us to advance to advance the mitigation of risk and the maximization of benefits. Another option is that they, the engineers and, and the future leaders, invent some new technology. And I know it's difficult to imagine but it is pretty certain there will be a life after Google and, and, and Meta and Amazon and so forth, but because companies usually they don't last for you know, hundreds of years. Some do, some do. I mean, the oldest companies are actually some German breweries. <laughs> They've been lasting for a long time. So if you have a business like that, that keeps on going for, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But usually companies get replaced by technological innovation. And that comes the day the new ones come and have a different paradigm. And that's the part where we'll talk about the blockchain. <laughs> No, <laughs> not yet. You will hear me talk a lot about the blockchain, but in the next session. But the blockchain is it's kind of like a running gag. And in some conferences, somebody always comes up and says, but the blockchain will solve everything, or the metaverse, or the newest thing, or machine learning, or transformer, neural nets will solve it. And that's you know the promise of new technology. But what we know is, yes, we can technologize our way out of that in, in, in some degree. And that's an important path to pursue. There's a paradigm that's inherently might be inherently different to the problems that has been created. You know, the blockchain, some blockchains are inherently decentralized, whereas store information decentralized, whereas the current paradigm stores information very centralized on a centralized server owned by a Google Meta or, or whatever. So yeah, there's differences that might solve some problems and surely will create new ones because no technology is inherently good or bad. But that's another thing, we create something new. They, well, they create something new. Then also we, more like starting with the person in the mirror, we change the existing, and that usually happens by the power of the people through, well, through the government, through regulation, through the ones who make the laws, the legislators, and then the ones that execute the laws, the executive power and the judicial power who says like, actually, well, are you, are you complying with what we've been doing there? And there's a lot of things going on. I mean, when we first introduced the cars, there wasn't even a traffic light at DMV. We didn't know if to drive left or right. And the biggest concern was that we will scare the horses. So yes, it, it took a long time coming until we, we, we agree on a regulation of, a, of a, a new technology. And then the last part that I'm, I'm researching very actively in that, and I think it's a often underestimated, but a very important path of, of getting the best out of that is that we, also we humans, might need to evolve. We call ourselves the Homo sapiens, actually the Homo sapiens sapiens, the one who knows that knows. So, and we created a technology that knows, certainly has knowledge. I mean, a generative AI nowadays can explain to you why a joke is funny. Ask it, go to your favorite generative AI and, and ask it, you know, the question, why is this joke funny? It will explain it. It's very difficult to not have understanding, not have knowledge about what's going on in order to explain something like this. So, well, if we are the Homo sapiens, then maybe we have to evolve more to the Homo sapiens 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 or, or, or what's after that. Because you now the evolutionary pressure might be on and most likely is on. The evolutionary pressure about the superiority over our minds, including thinking and feeling. That's all that mind stuff. And you now persuasive technology has become very powerful in dominating our thinking and 
our feelings. All right, so let's go through the, these four different options with, with some examples. Okay, they, uh, the existing powers, and there have been some ingenious studies and I will not go through all of them, but we know that some of how the existing models are going is not going too well. For example, these economists here did a, did a study around one of the US elections and they motivated people, actually had to pay people to turn off Facebook for four weeks. A very clean study, as far as I can see, I was really impressed with it. And they found interesting things when people turned up Facebook for four weeks. First of all, they were much less informed about politics because usually we use social media to inform ourselves, but they were more politically engaged. And polarization also decreased. You know, this gap between the left and the right, and this polarization has been, political scientists have tell us it has, it has increased over the last two decades quite a bit. We were much more centrist, say, two decades ago. And then over, over 20 years, it has increased. And turning off Facebook just for four weeks returned the wheel of time almost by half. So that's quite impressive. So there seems to be some effect with the existing model or with not doing the existing model. What happened to people's happiness was also well-being was quite impressive. Subjective uh, happiness and life satisfaction got increased. Depression and anxiety got decreased significantly. And in general, subjective well-being increased as much as about up to 40% of a psychotherapy. So if you have an issue, who doesn't have issues, then you, know, you go to psychotherapy and you really work on your issues, or you just turn off Facebook for four weeks and 40%, you can up, up to 40% of the effect will be there. I mean, that is that is really quite impressive. It also increased subjective well-being. Subjective well-being to some degree has to do with income. Money doesn't make you absolutely happy, but it has a certain degree and there's an intricate relationship between income and happiness and well-being. And it increased four weeks of non-Facebook, increased the equivalent of your subjective well-being as about 30,000 additional dollars per year. So you could get a another job and earn $30,000, that's you know full-time salary for some jobs, or just turn on Facebook for four weeks and have a, a very comparative effect in, in, in how you feel happy about yourself in, in the general situation. So yes, we know the existing, there's, there's some more work to do, let's make it sure. There's more work to do with the, with the existing models and it doesn't have not only positive effects, right? So new technologies, as I said, I'm not gonna talk about the blockchain, <laughs> do that next session, get ready, please. There will be a lot coming. But you know, it basically that means you, you fight fire with fire. So you, you regulate tech with tech. And one of the things that, that have been proposed is, for example, to fight the addiction problems, you just put some time well spent regulator screen, screen trackers on, on your devices. And these devices, they have been introduced over the last decade and they've been taken up by, by tech companies. They all introduced them. So in your, in your mobile phone, TV, in your social media, you can now adjust a, a little you know, an artificial intelligence, you might say, a rudimentary that says, hey, you've been watching this channel now for 40 minutes and you actually told me before you only wanted to maximally watch 40 minutes, isn't it time to take a break? And it reminds you, or you can set it like after whatever, 8 p.m., your phone goes gray. Or you cannot even open your social media account at 8 p.m. You basically, you know that you're weak and you're trying to regulate your volitional impairment <laughs> that with, with some other uh, nudging, positive nudge. And these are all technical terms. We talked about all of them in, uh, today, today in, this, in this session on social media. Now, the obvious critique for that is, is like, okay, so the tech companies kind of like help to create this problem, then they want to regulate it. And it's kind of like big tobacco saying like, well, with this new app, you're in charge to see how much you want to smoke today. And you can in the evening or, or like in the morning, during the hangover, you can say, today, I really do not. I don't want to ever do this again. You say that in the morning and then you know, when the next weekend comes, there is your app and like that. So that's the critique. And there are some interesting studies of like how much people it actually has. But I mean, the bigger story is, yes, we can have tech. We can fight fire with fire. It's not always easy. And often that happens with a real paradigm shift, like with a completely new technology that just changes things. And we will talk more about what a, a new technology, what a disruptive, creative destruction technology is. We talk about that in the in the end of this of this specialization in, in future lectures. And uh, that usually what what kind of like mitigates some of the downsides, but then 
inevitably creates a new one because no technology is, is, is purpose. Okay, then regulation. And regulation is very important and also an inherent part of it. Again, at the end of the specialization, we will talk a lot about that, that the social evolution that we are in needs to be shaped. So we will study in, in this course is the social evolution. And then we will see how we can shape it with policies in order to foster some aspects and regulate and, and, and tune down some other ones. And this is because the technology always comes up and there's new aspects of technology that come up that we need to need to regulate. For example, one thing that if it's extremely severe, regulators have been quite quick on, for example, deep fakes. So deep fakes, the discussion, it's, it's, a, it's a portmanteau of deep learning and fake, so it's deep fakes. It's basically synthetic manipulation of some existing images or videos or created, synthetically created ones to present something completely new. So as you can see here in this video from the, from the researcher, you can actually make any face you want. And that can be extremely dangerous because I can just go to your social media account and take all your friends and family. And then I can make an image of somebody, an avatar, that is a combination of them. And you will trust this person. So if that salesman, salesman, saleswoman, salesperson now knocks on your door, you will see this person for the first time and you don't know why. But you kind of like trust that person. There's something here that you say like, yeah, that's a trustworthy person. And they're going to sell you the next snake oil. Or, for example, in politics uh, is extremely dangerous because, again, one of the cognitive biases is that we really remember what we see with our eyes. So I can take a politician and put anything I want into the word of the politician and then later on tell you with a little disclaimer on the bottom, hey, that was just, you know, that was just fake. But you saw it with your own eyes. So if six months later I ask you about it, you are more likely to remember what you saw. You will have forgotten that I told you, hey, just kidding. So it's, 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 that's also why these things are not new. That's why some religions have a prohibition of images of certain things. Because these religions, these traditional says, if you have an image of something that, for example, reassembles something like a god, then you cannot take it out of your mind and you, you convert that into what it is. And that's not what it is. That's why they prohibit having that. So it's a long, it's a very well-known cognitive bias that we have. And deep fakes go into that. And some, for example, China and California have been very quick in regulating that. In, 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 in other places, not. So you have to be really careful when you're around there. Now... There are some other legislations that haven't caught up. And some of the legislations, not because there's something new, it's something extremely old. We just haven't adjusted the legislation. So for example, there is something called in that, again, the Center for Humane Technology around Tristan Harris and friends promoted that a lot. There's something called fiduciary duty that is in any kind of law around the world in any country has something like fiduciary duty in it. And that's an obligation to act in the best interest of another party, especially if there is an information asymmetry. That means if one party knows a lot about the other party, then the fiduciary duty tells you that you should not abuse that. For example, if somebody goes to a priest and you tell all your sins, the priest is not allowed to say, oh, that is interesting. Can I sell that to the who wants? I just learned something really cool. I'm just going to go outside and sell it to the highest bidder. Or a psychologist. As I told you, you could just tell all the problems and struggles. The psychologist cannot say, oh, that's what I need to say. I go in the open marketplace. Who wants me? Who bids me the most money to exploit the psychological weakness? Like this person just has a trauma right now. I just learned. I can tell you all about this trauma. I have all this information about it now. Who is the highest bidder of how to exploit the trauma of this person? I mean, that is, would not be allowed for the psychologist. Now, persuasive technology algorithms, they know you often better than your psychologists in some aspects. And they sell it to the highest bidder of exploiting it. That's just, that's just the business model. Or a doctor knows about your weakness, is not allowed to, to go with this information and like has to fiduciary duty and obligation to act in the best interest of another party. Or a lawyer cannot just turn around and say like, oh, the wife just in the divorce case told me this. So the husband is like, oh, now I'm going to no, I have to act in the best interest of that party. Even if the lawyer might defend a murderer who is like, then it still has to a fiduciary duty because it knows some details about it. Or last but not least, teachers like, like me. I mean, you, you get to know a lot of learning habits of students and it's not allowed for me to go and sell that to the highest bidder and, and take advantage of this information, additional information that I gather. However, 
pervasive technology has permission to do that. And this is a case where existing law has just not, not really caught up with it and just needs to be adjusted. All right, and then last but not least, we also probably need to evolve to, towards a new human. And that's a concept that we like, that has to do with human development. So we, we develop, we, we roll out the human from you know, the Homo habilis, the Homo erectus, and the, the Homo sapiens and the sapiens sapiens. And the question, is there a development stage on that kind of scale beyond that? So the human development and development is kind of like it develops. It's the opposite of uh, the Entwicklung or Desarrollo is the opposite of envelope or Einwicklung or en Enroyar. So Desarrollar, it, it goes forward. So is there another stage forward also for human development in that sense. And so we've been very interested in, in that question. Are there some humans that might be ahead of us and that, for example, we cannot, for the heck of us, get to manipulate them with persuasive technology? So we developed this concept, we started to call it digital immunity. That's a very interesting question, right? So do you have some people with some psychological characteristics that you send through normal social media hell and you cannot manipulate them? And Yes, there is. There, there are some characteristics. We don't understand it really yet, but it seems to do. It seems especially for people who are uh, who basically have transcended their mind. The, the technical term is self transcendence. That Maslow. Remember Maslow from the from this pyramid of needs, the Maslowian pyramid. On top of this pyramid is a stage that's called self transcendence. So these are very few in between between us that transcended their mind and look at their own mind. It's kind of like from a third person perspective almost, the, the thoughts and emotions. Some of them are really talking about themselves in third person. But then once you try to, that, that's what these, these technology are extensions of the mind. So once you latch on, uh, and since they are non-attached, they transcended their own like mind, they can choose to engage, but don't have to, then also it makes sense. It's actually the low hanging fruit that they are also non-attached to, to, to the manipulations of the mind extensions. And, and that's the question, right? So who is really in charge? So these are extensions of the mind that log on to your mind. And in the Anthropocene, well, supposedly, we are the ones who are in charge. Brings me back to the beginning. Now, to take one of these books uh, that tell you how to get you hooked, it says explicitly, I find it very interesting, to initiate online action, doing must be easier than thinking. It needs to be done with little or no conscious thought. So the best way how you can people into pervasive technology, how you can like predict their behavior and make them do whatever you want to make them, make them click, make them view, make them like, make them dislike, make them interact, make them engage, is without consciousness. Like be unconscious, almost like a wheel in the clockwork. And that's now the question. Is there, is there more, right? What, what happens in the space of consciousness? And that leads us to, to this research. Is there a homo conscientis beyond the homo sapiens? And Actually, some researchers define mental health as that, that has this conscious space that are mindful, mindfulness, very important term here, of what's happening with their mind. So May defined in the 1960s, defined mental health as the capacity to be aware of the gap between stimulus and response, together with the capacity to use this gap constructively. So stimulus, response. That's what persuasive technology is doing. Stimulus, response, stimulus, response. And then you are there on the social media, completely unconscious, without conscious thoughts, just like being a machine yourself, being manipulated by another machine. Now, if you're aware of the gap between stimulus and response, you're mindful of it, then you can use it constructively. You have free will. Or to use it in the words of a more popular book, is there's a gap or a space between stimulus and response. And the key to both our growth and happiness is how... We, we use that space. And we saw that especially, you know, the pandemic has been very interesting because people have kind of like we're forced into a forced marriage with our digital technology because of social distancing. We all had to stay home for a couple of years and it became much more intense. And during that time, we did some research for the United Nations in, in Latin America, actually. And we used Facebook data themselves to see what's happening with people in Latin America. And one thing that I found fascinating is interest in meditation increased a lot. So if you have the, the, among the percentage of the population, the female, but women, of course, always ahead, no, over 20% from you know, a little more than 10%, almost double, same for men, from less than 5% to more than 10% of the population in Latin America got during the pandemic interested in meditation. Because, you know, 
what is meditation is to get to know your mind. So there are different exercises. And there are so many different meditations that you cannot even like thousands of like you say, there are sports. I mean, there's so many different sports and there are so many different ways. There's many different ways to exercise your body and there's many different ways you can get to know your mind. So there are many different meditations, but people got drawn to that. And, and I, I don't have any proof, but I wouldn't be surprised if that would not be coincidence that this happened, especially during the pandemic. But let's check it out ourselves. Let's have a little, a little test here, right live. Two important concepts that I always use is once you're engaged with social media, with persuasive tech or with this technology, use the word stop and wait a lot. Stop stays for, well, stop, take a breath and observe. Observe what's going on with your mind. What's going on with it? What do you think about what I just said here? What are the emotions that this triggers? And who has that opinion? Is that me in your mind? Media, a media opinion that comes to you? Or where does that opinion come from? And who is in charge when you're mindful of your mind? And proceed. And now when you want to comment, that's when you consume, stop sometimes. And when you won't be proactive, uh, wait, ask yourself, why am I talking? And if most of us would do that more regularly, I think the amount of things that are on, you know, on our platforms would probably be a little bit higher quality. <laughs> Anyways, that's what I want to end up with. And that is a completely open research question. But my hunch and my hypothesis is that probably humankind will have to evolve because artificial intelligence is, has become to that level of where most of us identify our self with our mind, with our thoughts and our emotions. But it's also pretty clear that there's more than our thoughts and our emotions to make us human. And we might have to evolve towards more identifying with that. Anyways, with that, I leave you. Right now, this has been so, of course, the, the power, the existing powers, certainly not all things go well, can take more responsibility and are taking responsibility. New technology will come along inevitably to solve some of these problems and inevitably create others. We, we do have to regulate some things as with any technology and many tech companies also beg for much clearer guidelines. And that is from the existing social media technology until you know the newest one, the, the, the blockchain technology. And then we humans might need to evolve as well. All right, so today we took our cube, our framework that we have here in the specialization and throughout this entire specialization through the different courses and sessions, we will explore that much more. Today we took a deep dive on one specific aspect on social media and we talked about how the software aspect, the, well, the machine learning in that case, the persuasive technology through A-B testing actually created some kind of pattern that was a reinforcement pattern that came about that affected humans. So watch time maximization algorithm you know, might have contributed to, to, to some differential susceptibility of some getting addicted. And now the question is, how can we reduce with negative feedback and put that entire dynamic a little bit more, more into place to maximize the benefits and mitigate and minimize the involved risk? And we will play much more around with the cube throughout the rest of the specialization of the different courses. Today was a long one. Thank you very much for your attention.